Welcome to season three of the Lifestyle Chase, and I'm your host, Chris Little. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. To help this podcast grow, please share it on social media, rate five stars, tell your friends, and check out the past 140 episodes and counting. You can follow me on Instagram at Christian Little and at The Lifestyle Chase. Thanks for listening. Let's get started. All right, so welcome to the Lifestyle Chase. We are live, and I am joined for episode 189 by the one and only Gavin McHale, of which I had the pleasure of talking to earlier this week for his show. Uh, He is the host of the Coach's Playground. Um, He's been around. He's got a lot of experience in this industry. And to be honest, I'm just looking forward to getting to know you better today. So how are you doing today? How is your day going? Beautiful, man. Thank you for calling me the one and only. Uh, I'm doing well. I'm doing really well. We've had a bunch of coaching calls today. Uh, it's just, it's been a good, it's been a good solid day. Good solid Wednesday. Did the, the, uh, holiday kind of throw off your week at all? I know a lot of people are forgetting what day it is today. Yeah, I, um, I have had a tendency in the past, actually, my mother-in-law called me out on it on the weekend to forget about holiday weekends and just keep on plowing through and uh but luckily this you know before the summer i i blocked off my days for the holidays and yeah it throws you off a little bit when you're when you're getting back into it it's like you look up it's already wednesday afternoon and and you know there's work to be done i mean that's interesting because it's kind of like i run the same way it's like aside from if i do like a social gathering with people who are used to like the normal week flow like aside from that, I will just treat it like every other day and I won't even like set that boundary to set time aside for a holiday. So I like that you brought that up. But before we get into that, um, I'll kind of give some backstory as to uh, one of the biggest connecting pieces for for us. I really liked when you had Katie St. Clair on your show. And that's yeah. kind of what, what got my attention. Um, Katie St. Clair is someone who I have quite a bit of respect for. And just I've learned so much from her and my knowledge of her on the internet. And then it's just kind of like all this stuff kind of spiders out from there. And then just seeing that you're a fellow Canadian kind of got me excited. Um, but with all of that being said, I'd like you to have the opportunity to kind of introduce yourself the, the way you'd want to be introduced kind of thing. Cool, man. Yeah. Um, Katie's been Katie's been such a great uh, such a great relationship for me as well. Just like every time we get on the phone, it's great conversation, and and she's uh, we have a lot of the same views. Um, I was actually introduced to her by Tony Gentlecore, who I had on my show as well. Um, but yeah, in terms of an intro for me, um, you know, at the end of the day, man, I have realized a lot about myself in the past year just in doing a lot of inquiry work and a lot of self-awareness work. And, and one of the biggest things for me is I, I want to connect humans to the highest version of themselves. And what I mean by that is, is I feel like everyone has this potential deep within themselves, but a lot of us uh, through societal programming, through what we've been taught to believe, uh, through not wanting to um, rub people the wrong way, so to speak, we kind of mute ourselves and we don't allow ourselves to really live that that highest potential or that best self. Uh, I was the worst culprit of it uh, for a long time and I'm consistently working to get better at it, but I feel like that's kind of um, the more work I do. That's, that's my purpose here. So yeah, I coach, I coach fitness professionals and I used to be a fitness professional myself, but uh, I like to connect humans to the highest version of themselves. I like that. I mean, like I can see what you mean there and it. uh, it's good to have like a way to make it simple. Like people talk about that expression, like tell someone what you do for work as though you're telling like a four year old and like a, like a toddler would be able to understand that they'd be, Oh, okay. Like I, I can see what he's doing there. Um, another side note, it's cool that you mentioned Tony general because he'll be on the lifestyle chase on Friday. So just kind of connecting the dots here. And it's just kind of cool because For me, I like to drop little hints throughout the episode to kind of just get people to like look through the list and see these other names. But with that being said, um, 
when I was kind of preparing for this episode, I saw that uh, you had an article on Tony Gentilcore's website. Like you, you kind of go back with him a little bit. Like, tell me a bit more about that. What was it, that part of your career like? I think that's a really, there's a really good lesson in that. So um, this was, oh, I can't even remember when that was. Was that like maybe 2015, 20, no, maybe 2017? It, it seemed like 2016, 2017, if I'm yeah. just guessing. Yeah. So um, basically I've been, I was in the fitness industry from about 2011 to, to 2020. And um, I really saw the value in, this was kind of my first time noticing the value in kind of hacking others uh, audiences, but also like uh, gaining authority through writing for other people and, and helping them out or, or giving a different perspective uh, for their readers and um, went down to Minneapolis. I'm in Winnipeg. So drove down to Minneapolis with a couple guys a couple other fitness professionals to see Tony and Dean Somerset speak. And um, they were speaking on the hip and shoulder. And a lot of what Tony said really resonated with me. Like it was stuff that I kind of knew about around like breathing and, and shoulder mechanics, but I really got a better understanding of it through that presentation. And so we connected afterwards. And that's something that I always tried to do is not only connect with the other people in the, in the group that I was with, but also connect with the, with the coaches and the, like the people who were speaking. And after that, it was just kind of one of those shots in the dark, like, Hey man, I got a lot out of your presentation. Would you mind if I wrote kind of an article summing it up on your website? And he, of course, if you know, Tony, he was in, super cool about it. He was like, yeah, hell yeah. I think he actually even gave me a couple of edits. Like he was like, Hey, you know, this is good, but here's a couple of points that you could change around or could you write this differently and really help me become a better writer. But yeah, that was a big thing. I, I, I worked pretty hard to get on T nation. I wrote for Tony uh, and I wrote for John Russin. Um, and, and it in, at the time was super valuable just to get my name out there and to get more people knowing what I did and who I was. Well, I mean, I think a lot of times people hesitate to take that chance. Like, it's just that whole putting yourself out there, just like best foot forward. And it's kind of you, you outlined the support that you received in editing. And it's like, we can't expect our first attempt to be perfect, but yeah. we're not going to have one if we don't make one. Like, I mean, um, to kind of talk about how you travel down there, like we, we had kind of talked off of this show about the value of going to, um, different fitness summits and stuff. And we realized we had gone to the same one just years apart. Um, yeah. what was the, the fitness summit, the Kansas city fitness summit like for you when you went, what was life like when you made that trip? Oh man, I was, um, so I was like brand new at that time, it was probably 2013. Uh, and I was living at home. I was dating my girlfriend who's now my wife just started dating her. And I realized like I was kind of, I felt segregated from a lot of the people like in the industry, you know, there was obviously the people in the Winnipeg fitness industry, but I knew there was a bigger world. And so I saw this, this fitness summit on probably on Facebook or something. And, um, it's thinking back, like just as I'm recounting it, it's unbelievable what went down for me there. So I had no money <laughs> I, uh, and I knew nobody. And the, the basically it's Kansas city. I'm in Winnipeg. It's straight shot South. So I got in my car and I drove, I drove 11 hours uh, straight shot. I left cause I didn't want to miss too much work. Uh, I left on like, I think it, 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 I think it was Friday, Saturday. So I left Thursday morning, 6am. I drove straight through, got there just after dinner, uh, after a couple stops and some construction and, um, and knew nobody. And I remember sitting, uh, I remember walking into the, walking into the, the hotel lobby and there was a whole bunch of people that were at the conference in, in the, in the lobby bar. And got settled in my room, which again, I was on my own. I didn't know anybody, so I didn't room with anybody. So I paid for my own room and came back down to the lobby bar and ordered, you know, ordered a drink and kind of sat on my own. And I remember how freaking scared I was to just go and say hi to people because if, I had never done anything like this. And there's like, I don't know if you know these names, but like Eric Bach is sitting down there, uh, Jason Helms, uh, Nick Sorrell, 
um, a whole bunch of people who at the, I, like, I didn't really know. Um, but at the time were like coming up in the industry. Um, there was, there was a few other, there was a few other people and, I finally kind of got the, got the, the courage to go speak to some people. Um, actually, I don't, I don't even think they're still in the industry, but army leg and, um, Del Farrell, she was, she's Australian actually. And I spoke to them, went to the, went and sat by the bonfire pit with them and just chatted with them for the evening. And, um, through that, I got the opportunity. I had a car there. So I said, Hey, anybody who needs, cause I don't know if it's still like this, but it's pretty mom and pop type thing. It's like, you know, Oh, we're over here at this gym. Everybody find your way over. Like, kind of like my parents will sign you up the guy who runs it. And it's a very, uh, kind of a low key thing. So I was just like, Hey, anybody the next morning, anybody who needs a ride, well, who puts their hand up for a ride, Nick Tuminello and Jonathan Goodman, two of the people speaking and two people who I literally idolize. And now I'm sitting in my car. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm driving Nick Tuminello and Jonathan Goodman to this, to this gym. I've, I've no business being in this car. Um, and it was just super cool to just, and I heard them chatting on the way. I just shut my mouth and let them talk. Um, and it was, you know, there, there were now that I've been to other summits and other uh, conferences, there were good and bad parts to that conference, but the best part was that it kind of, it kind of introduced me to the fact that like these people were, uh, readily available and that there was another level that I hadn't even really scratched the surface of, um, in terms of my business, in terms of every, every part of, of, uh, what I was doing in my life at the time. Well, I mean that, that is awesome because it's so relatable for me. Anybody that kind of knows my story and I, it takes, I'll take 20 minutes to tell it. So I'll just brush past that. But it's just like, uh, the value of just putting yourself out there, doing whatever you have to do to to get out there. And it's just like you talked about Nick Sorrell and it's funny because like he's helping me with a project for the show. Like him and I are kindred spirits. Like uh, I sat in the front row when I watched him present and we just found that we had a lot in common and we just like chatting. And that's been like the value above all else the friendships that I've attained. Like for me, I'm, uh, I recently did my, redid my Myers-Briggs. I realized I'm very introverted and that, uh, the connections that we make mean a lot to me. Like, um, I would sacrifice success, um, in, 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 uh, if, if I could have a deeper connection, I would put success to the side kind of thing to, to say that more clearly. It, it's, weird because it's like it's not that i would uh hold myself back but it just outlines how important like genuine authentic connections mean to me and it even outlined it with with just gym atmospheres and that kind of to bring it back to you because i don't want to take up all the time um are you introverted or extroverted like where where do you fall on that whole uh spectrum of things I wish I had done a Myers-Briggs. I haven't done one yet, but you've talked about it and a lot of people have. Um, for me, the environment is crucial. If you put me in a safe space where I feel like um, everybody there is, you know, I, I the history is long, but, you know, I was a pretty nerdy kid who didn't really get too many, uh, d- didn't really get too much help in in middle school, those formative years. And had a lot of uh, like feelings of rejection and those things. And I think one of the scariest things for me, if I'm, if I'm in a new place or a new experience like that one was, is that I will be rejected or that I will be made fun of, or that, you know, people won't invite me into their circle. And then as soon as I, as soon as I, you know, got over the vomiting feeling and went over and talked to somebody, then they allowed me they're like yeah hey come on sit down you want to hang out with us and it was like we talked till like one in the morning you know and uh i've had that happen before when when i've been in the safe space at conferences and things like that where other people are sharing other people are being vulnerable i can easily be vulnerable but you put me in a new space where um sorry there's some fire trucks outside uh, you put me in a new space where where it's uncomfortable for me, and I feel alone, or or I don't, or I feel um, a little bit less than, and I become very introverted. I become very much in my own head. I'll, all I'm doing is just thinking about like 
like I could put myself right in that room again of just like looking around and going like, I, I don't have the confidence to talk to any of these people right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that sounds relatable. That, that would probably be how I would feel. And it's just like you telling the story and just kind of getting set up in your room and you didn't know anybody. Like I was lucky because I had a few friends that were at the conference. So I knew a couple people and then it just kind of spired out from there. Like I had people that would um, kind of break the ice and just make sure I had a ride and all these other things. Um, yeah. but I know that feeling of just like, okay, what do we do? Like, I recognize like half of these faces. A lot of these people are people that I look up to. Um, yeah. what's, what's next? Um, when you, when you talked about those like self-conscious feelings and just those, those kind of like getting in your head in your career, because there's been a few years to it. Um, when have you felt the most in your head? Like when's been like the toughest, like darkest pit of, of your fitness career? Oh man, the most in my head, uh, you know, this was actually in the transition from the fitness career to the, um, to the business mentorship. Uh, it just pops into my head. So I hope that's okay <laughs> that I go with that one, but I was running my fitness business and I was doing pretty well with my fitness business, but I knew I wanted to make the change over to uh, business mentorship. And, um, so this is December, 2019. I had been doing this thing for like three months, like seriously doing it. I had done a beta test and those types of things. And I was still making pretty good money in my fitness business. Uh, I was definitely paying the bills and, and we were driving. It was like December and my wife and I were driving and I was complaining. I was like, I just can't seem to get like no one saying yes. I was on a ton of sales calls. I was getting a bunch of no's. Uh, and she's been super supportive of me. And, and I remember her saying like, are you sure? Like, are you sure about this? And, um, it, you know, that was a moment where there was a shift, but leading up to that moment was, I was so in my head, like, um, you know, who am I to be, to be, you know, r running a business mentorship? I, you know, I, yeah, I've done some good things with my business, but you know, there's all these other people, like the people that you probably met at the fitness summit that I'm like, well, they're better than me and, and they're not doing it. Or, or, um, you know, I'm not a good enough salesperson or, you know, tying your identity to when someone says no, you know, that means that I'm not good enough, that they don't like me when that's not the case at all. Uh, or that means that, you know, I'm, my business is not good enough. And, and I think I got so in my head and I got so to a place where, I was just like coming from such a place of scarcity that, um, you know, just getting on the phone, it was like, I sh it should have been obvious that I wasn't going to make the sale because I was coming from a place of scarcity and I want your business and I want you to make me feel better about myself. And when my wife asked me that question, it really allowed me to reflect and, and say, no, like, I know things are hard right now but I 100% know that this is the next step for me. This is the place that I need to go. And it's time for me to lean in. It's time for me to lean into the tough spots. It's time for me to send in, send in, you know, feedback, uh, send in sales calls for feedback, send in conversations. What am I doing wrong? Get help. Uh, because the number one thing that gets you out of your own head is action. You know, going over and talking to those people at the bonfire, sending in sales calls for feedback, and just the action of saying to myself and to my wife, the person who had supported me the most in the world, no, I'm going to go all in on this thing. Cause, you know, I very easily could have gone back to mediocrity. I very easily, and that like there's nothing mediocre about running a fitness business, but. I was, you know, selling, I wasn't selling at a price point as high as I should have been. And there were a lot of people that I worked with that I had been working with for a very long time. And I just was kind of bored at that point. And I could have stayed there and just made pretty good money and been okay and sailed off into the sunset. But I knew there was more for me there. So just like, it really allowed me to kind of see, yes, I am too much in my head. And the number one thing I need to do is, is get into action and, and get out of my head. I mean, that that is pretty powerful because I think a lot of people will relate. There's times in this career where um, certain aspects to the feedback that we receive from people in our life can kind of get us thinking. Like you, you talked about um, just your discussion with your wife and it's just like lots of people, whether it, like it could be their best friends, it could be their colleagues in the industry, it could be parents, it could be 
if people talk to their dog, <laughs> like yeah. just little things that people say can kind of get in your head and, and spark thought and spark doubt and spark action. And it's just like how you, how you take that. And then for yourself, like, because it's, it's not like everything is sunshine and roses, even once you get going, but once you got some momentum, like how, how did you keep fueling that? Oh man, such a, such a great, point is like it's definitely not all sunshine and roses but how do i keep feeling it i think um i i heard i was listening to a podcast yesterday and they talked about the difference between motivation and inspiration and uh, i don't know if you've heard this but if you think of a campfire motivation is like the kindling and the paper and and the match that's going to get it started right it burns it burns fast it burns big and it burns hot but then it burns out pretty quickly, right? Um, inspiration is the longer tail is when the, the big log catches is when and that can burn for the whole night, right when you have a bonfire going. And Tony Robbins was asked in his Netflix documentary, uh, I'm not your guru, like what motivates you? How do you stay motivated? He said, I'm not doing this. This isn't motivation. This, uh, this is well beyond motivation. This is inspiration. And it's my why, my deeper seated reason is literally pulling me, right? This is way more than I ever could have imagined it would be, but I'm being pulled by something bigger than me. And I think, you know, I got going with motivation. I, I, I wanted to help. I wanted to help people who were like me. But when I got really clear on my why, when I got really clear on my purpose, um, I have it literally right here in front of me. Um, the, 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 I have a video or a picture from a video from 2015, um, of, of former coach Gavin, who was a really good coach, but he had no idea how to market himself and had no idea how to reach more people and impact more people. When you get really, really clear on why you're doing what you're doing, you don't, I mean, it just starts to build on itself. And, and then no matter how hard the times are, you, your next step is always there. Your next step is always clear because it's a compass for you. It just makes your decision for you and it allows you to move forward. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Like it's just basically if, if somebody doesn't have like a reason that like pulls them to, to be in this line of work, it's going to be really tough because they're going to yeah. need that. They're going to need that to kind of like form their decisions that help them grow, whether it be, uh, going to a conference when you're absolutely broke or yep. working the tough hours that it takes to, to build up a client roster kind of thing. Um, yep. there, there's something that like pops up quite often when I think about you, because it's like when, when you're learning about someone, it's always cool to have like a fun fact about them. And in my preparation, like I, I saw that you got some rare opportunities associated with the, the NHL. You got to be like a, a backup, backup goalie and, and like not to like, uh, like that is an unreal opportunity. Like I am extremely jealous. How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So talk about putting yourself into a, a, you know, luck being, what is it where preparation meets opportunity? Um, I actually wrote something about this on when it actually happened on my Instagram. This is way back, but um, to give you the Coles notes, uh, I live in Winnipeg, which is an NHL city. And a couple of years ago, this was, I think 2017, the NHL implemented a rule that every, every arena uh, had to have one goalie who could play for both teams. They were called the emergency backup goalie. Um, what had happened is a couple of times, you know, teams carry two goalies and a couple of times both goalies got hurt and they would either have to like forfeit the game or put like coach in net or put a player in net, which is just ridiculous. Um, so they implemented this rule and I got, I was lucky enough that the Winnipeg hockey world is tiny and um, you can't, you couldn't have ever been paid to play hockey. You couldn't have played pro. So I was lucky that in that sense that I had just played college. And um, so I got a call from the, from the assistant GM of the jets. And he asked me if I wanted to do this, this gig as the emergency backup goalie. And I was like, uh, hell yeah. And um, essentially there were six of us and we rotated through. And when you got to go, you got to, you know, take a guest, you got to sit in the press box, you got dinner and, 
you know, there was the pos- the very rare possibility that you may play. And it's kind of like, that's kind of the running joke. Right. And, uh, so I'd be crushing popcorn and candy and, you know, like, I'm not going to play whatever. Um, and, uh, yeah. So it just so happened this one night, um, the jets were playing Washington and I had picked that game because they were the defending cup champs. It was the only time they were coming. And I was actually coaching, I coached the, the university women's hockey team here. I coached the goalies and I was, um, at their practice. And then I was going to just go straight from there, pick up my mom, who was my guest and drive downtown and have dinner there and watch the warm up, and then watch the game. Well, I had about 10 missed calls and a bunch of missed texts from a random number when I got off the ice and turns out they, it was their goalie coach calling me and saying, you know, one of our goalies can't dress tonight. Um, you're in, we need you. So it was a whole whirlwind of emotions uh, and not to mention uh, having to drive from the South end of the city to downtown in rush hour on a Jets game night. Um, so there was a whole bunch of, of things that went down, but, you know, being able to tell my mom like, Hey, I'm not going to be taking you to the game because you're going to be going to the press box with dad because I'm in, I'm going to be dressing. Uh, being able to call my dad and say, get your boots on and you're, you're coming to the game, you know, put your sushi in the fridge and, uh, and you're coming to the game and you're going to watch me warm up with, with Alex Ovechkin. Um, and then just walking in, walking in and, and having Alex Ovechkin and Evgeny Kuznetsov introduce themselves to me and say, Hey, welcome to the team. And, um, literally treated as a part as as a part of the Washington Capitals organization for the day I walked in there was my name was on the stall my jersey was hanging this jersey right here was hanging in the stall um and like they were tapping me on the pads and everything and and it was just it was I always say to people for that one day I was the everyman. I was every person who ever played a sport who didn't make it, who wished that they could get that opportunity to go back and play for one day. And uh, it was a whirlwind. And I always say it's, it's, it's something no one can ever take away from me. I will always have that experience. I will always have that incredible experience. And I, I like literally, I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful to the, to the Capitals organization for treating me the way they did and to the jets organization for giving me that opportunity and for allowing my parents to come. They didn't have to do that. Um, but it was a really, really cool moment skating out on the ice and in my home rink where I had watched many a games and drank many a beers on the other side of the glass and, uh, and, and jumping on the ice and and then getting lit up by the likes of Alex Ovechkin and uh, TJ Oshie. (laughs) That's awesome. I mean, like there's so much about that, that is relatable. every underdog on every team just anybody who played a sport really because it's at such a high caliber level that there's going to be so many people that are like holy crap like if I could hold on to that moment and it kind of like it makes me think of a lot of my own experiences that I've held on to when I kind of needed that little nugget of like either reassurance or motivation or inspiration um have you found that that's transferred over to your professional life like within your business where you've like grabbed that and then used it to kind of like fuel you forward yeah I mean I had you know, there's a whole range of emotions that happen when something like this happens. But the first one is, is, you know, what did I do to deserve this? You know, I, I, I got cut, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't make it. Then there was a reason, you know, I wasn't good enough at the time when, when the NHL draft was, and you know, all those, when I had the opportunity, what did I do to deserve this? And then out of like all the teams and all the goalies in Winnipeg, how am I the one who gets this opportunity? And, you know, it immediately takes you back in business to imposter syndrome. You know, who am I to, to be, to be helping people build their businesses or who am I to be helping people with their fitness or who, who am I to be making six figures or whatever it is, you know, imposter syndrome is everywhere um, in our world these days, especially with social media. And I think that's helped a whole lot because while I, while I, you know, maybe didn't quote unquote deserve it because I hadn't made the team, I had, uh, I had kept in shape 
playing like high level senior hockey for, for several years and playing with a, a high level group of players that kept my name in the loop when they, when they were thinking about it. Um, I was in the fitness industry, so I was fit. I was staying in shape and like working out and eating well and all those things. Um, so that allowed them to know like, okay, this guy's not going to be just like a complete mess out there. And, uh, and like, I, I took it seriously. Like the night before I had uh, a game, like a, a game, an emergency backup game, even if I, you know, there was almost no chance of me playing. Like I wasn't going out and being an idiot. I was being smart. I was getting to bed. I was getting a good sleep. I was getting good meals. I was hydrating all those things. I think, you know, you talk about luck and you talk about coincidence and you you think, you know what? I put myself in that position. I gave myself every opportunity to succeed and the universe, I truly believe the universe conspires is always conspiring to help you. And, uh, I put it out there. I had a gratitude journal. Um, I don't know if you know the five minute journal, but the five minute journal asks you, you know, what are you grateful for this morning and what would make today awesome? And every time I had an emergency backup game, I wrote what would make today awesome, the chance to play in the NHL every day that I had one of those games. And that day at uh, the universe was like, okay, today's your day. We're going to, we're going to give you the opportunity. So, you know, there's so many times that I can lean on that. And and maybe it's not like a conscious thing, but it's one of those unconscious things to go like, there's another time that I have had no business deserving, deserving something quote unquote, but I put myself in the best position to succeed. And the universe, the universe paid me back in kind. Well, I mean, when you're talking about like, why me, why this, all that stuff, I was kind of thinking about, when I've been frustrated over like missing an opportunity to um, get a job or missing an opportunity to be on like any of those things where it's like, uh, why didn't they choose me? And then you get that one where it's like, holy crap, they, they chose me. We almost take those moments for granted, but it's, it's kind of like how you talk about the gratitude journal, like a structured focusing on the things that move us forward. Like yes. that's, that's been something that's, that's helped me in a big way is just, it kind of, it's, it's been on my mind all day of focusing on like the people who want to see you win, focusing on the, the moments where, where you are the one, where, where you are the show kind of thing. Um, with, with reference to that, like you talked about like your journaling and I think I saw on your story earlier today, you did some meditation. Is, is that right? Is with that my cat? Yeah, of course. You couldn't do it without. <laughs> um, is that kind of yeah. like a, a normal structured thing for you? Uh, hasn't always been. Um, I resisted. I resisted that kind of work for a very long time. Even after I saw the benefits of it, I still resisted it. And uh, one of the things I always say to people when they ask me about that, because I'm pretty open about my uh, woo woo stuff that I would have called bullshit for a long time before, um, but if you've ever read tools of the Titans by Tim Ferriss, I know a lot of people have some issues with Tim Ferriss, but the the reality of it is, is he has interviewed the most successful people on the face of the earth, Uh, billionaires, uh, Olympic athletes, um, business owners, all types of people. And in that book, before, before the start of the book, he does a little rundown of um, what are some of the themes that I have found through thousands of interviews with incredibly successful people. He said the number one theme, like 98% of the people that he's ever interviewed have some form of a daily mindfulness routine. Now that doesn't need to be, you know, writing your every thought in a journal that also doesn't need to be sitting in Lotus pose with your eyes closed and, and, and meditating for hours. Uh, It can be, uh, but it can also be going for a walk without your phone. It can also be, um, you know, just taking a few mindful breaths. It can also be something like the five minute journal. Like that's what, that's what I literally started with to start with some mindfulness. Um, and what I found is it's not necessarily like the, the standard stuff that you would think that is the most successful for me. It, it is, it is literally, and I'll say this to our clients and I'll say this to anyone listening, a mindfulness routine, first of all, is gives you an opportunity to get out of your own head, to get out of your own thoughts, to 
um, to start to visualize, maybe visualize the future and visualize something better um, to once you write your feelings down on paper, you take their power away. There's so many positive things about it, but you've got to find what works for you. You know, a lot of people struggle to visualize. So then don't visualize, you know, or a lot of people struggle to sit still. Okay. Well, can you go for, can you go for a walk on a beautiful day with, you know, without headphones in, without a phone and just, just walk. Um, there's so many ways that you can have a daily mindfulness routine that can, um, serve you, uh, that don't need to be, you know, sitting for hours on end doing crazy meditation techniques. Oh yeah, I completely agree. I mean, to relate to you, it's just even before this episode, because I got a lot of things that I do in a day and sometimes I'm not as effective as like switching the, the, the switch kind of thing. Like I'll be yeah. in one mode and then I'll still be in that mode when I go to the next task, but I just wanted a clear head. And so like uh, about an hour and a half before the episode, or maybe an hour before the episode, I just laid down, I put on a track from the, the calm app and just emptied my brain. Just it's yeah. uh cued me through some reflection and like I mean a person can go back in the episodes and see how I am and what I talk about and this is new this is something that I didn't I would talk about it and I would kind of like dance around it now I now I lean into it because I see how necessary it is like as you're ascending up the ladder of your respective career you need to be able to get some stuff out of your head and yep. have a very clear head for when you're making very big decisions, having very important conversations, et cetera. Um, something that I kind of ask guests about from time to time, and I haven't done it in a while, but you talked about how inspiration kind of uh, guided you forward. But something that I like to learn about people is like, if I asked you what your core values are, what would you respond? What, what are your core values? Such a, it's so interesting. Um, my wife has just been diving into this whole thing. Uh, it's been really exciting for me because we can have some great conversations, but there, there was a, some of the work she was doing was around core values and she was, she was like just going through it and it kind of allowed me to open back up and allowed me to kind of think about it again. And it's so funny when I first did them, uh, that was the first step of self-awareness for me. And I had, I had no clue. I called a friend and said, what is a core value? What does that mean? And how do you find it? And um, I did some work on it and how different they were from how they are now is, is unbelievable. Um, the, some of the ones that I like to live by um, and my wife has, has coined it really well is um, hers are kind of her like me to be. Like, this is the best version of me. Um, and these are some words or some feelings that really uh, resonate with that. And so one of them is, for me is is just, um, I really like and seek adventure. Um, and, and, and like, so adventure in terms of like, that could be a great conversation like this. Uh, that could be travel, uh, that, you know, traveling to new places. That could even be just like, um, saying yes to something I normally wouldn't say yes to. That's something that fires me up every single time is, is something adventurous. Um, another thing would, that, that has really served me well recently, that is something I really live by, but consistently have to work and remind myself to live by is, is called HILA or high intention, low attachment. So this works for sales, but this also works for anything in life is even coming into this interview is having the highest of intention for something. Uh, you know, if I'm on a sales call, I have the highest of intention for you. I want you to win and I want you to do well, but low attachment. I'm not attached to the outcome. I'm not attached to whether you say yes or no. And this is, was a great lesson I learned in sports highest of intention. I'm going to show up. I'm going to play my best. I'm going to do everything I can to win, but I'm not attached to the outcome. I'm focused on the process, knowing that the outcome is somewhat outside of my control. So I don't know if that really lands as a core value, but it's something that really uh, resonates deeply with me. And then the other, the other thing that I've, I've learned more recently is, is this 
this the value around um, building things. So I've always enjoyed building things, whether that be physically building things like Lego or, you know, like little projects with, with like lumber and building little steps or something like that. Uh, or like building businesses. I've really enjoyed that. Um, now building, now having built two businesses, um, but also like building relationships and, and, and even doing DIY projects around our house. We live in a 110 year old house. So there's lots of DIY projects. Um, but that's been something that I've really enjoyed too. And that again, can go to a bunch of different aspects. So, you know, if, if you were to ask, if you're putting me on the spot, I'd say those three adventure building and, and high intention, low attachment. I like it. And I mean, the way that I look at values, um, very similar to like meditation as to when you apply context to what those things are, you can understand like the direction that person is going and like where, where their boundaries are, where, where they draw the line, what their priorities are kind of thing. And, um, just even like kind of talking about always building something like that, that is probably quite common within our industry. Like we're always kind of like everything about uh, strength training is like, how are we going to create a progression? Like how, how are we going to increase volume? Like what are we going to do to get to that next level? Like how are we not going to plateau? Um, and something that I think about when I think about uh, just people in, in your position where you're going to be mentoring people is like, how, how does this person set goals? Like when I reflect on things, I'm like, okay, like I need to set goals myself. How do other people set goals? Like, uh, let, let's just hear it. Like, like, how do you formulate that? That how do you look at your quarter one for next year kind of thing? Yeah. So for me, in terms of setting goals, um, the first thing that I'll always do is I will, I will review. So if you're talking about Q1 or even Q4 for this year, I will review the previous stuff. So, um, you know, what, what just happened? And, and, and can we look at it objectively? Um, did we hit our goals? If we did, great, but we need to set bigger goals next, next quarter or next year or whatever it is. Um, if, if we miss them, how can we be as objective as possible and not tie emotion to that and realize, okay, what did we do? What did we do wrong? Was it, was the goal maybe not ideal or did we, you know, did I, not have the right systems in place, right? That we can shift, that we can change. Did I have, do I have to hire someone? Do I have to fire someone? Do I have to change the way that I'm doing things? That's the first thing I'll do is I'll look at what has happened. We need to kind of get a ground zero, right? And then what I'll do is, you know, literally just sit there and go, okay, what are, what are some, I, I like to call them instead of goals. I like to call them, my coach has helped me with this quests or adventures. Um, you know, what are some, what are some things that if I, if I, so let's say for Q3, uh, 2021, if I'm sitting there with Chris having a beer on September 30th at the end of Q3, what are, you know, two to five things that I want to have accomplished? What are the most important things in, in my world, in my, uh, personal life in my business that I want to have accomplished? So, um, the way I break those down, generally I like to do three because I'm a business owner. So I like to have one business one. I like to have one I like a health and well-being one. And I like to have one personal one. Now you can kind of, you can kind of, those all will go together in some way if you're doing things right, because it's kind of hard to separate work and, and, and life when you're doing it right. But, um, I like to kind of separate them in that way. And then the biggest thing I'll do is what, so what is the destination that I want to reach? And again, if you and I are having a beer, if you said, did you reach that goal? It should be a simple yes or no. It should be a very simple yes or no with no emotion behind it. Right. So a lot of people will say like, I want, you know, for example, a trainer will say, I want to work with more clients. Well, yeah, like that's a relatively simple yes or no, but like we have to define a lot of things there, right? So, you know, if you said by September 30th, I am consistently working with 10 clients per month. Now on September 30th, Chris can say, are you consistently working with 10 clients per month? 
Yes or no? It's that simple, right? Then once we have a clear destination, what is the intention behind that? So everyone gets so stuck on goals, but they don't really think about the fact that we're all very self-centered and we need to know like, why does that matter? Right? So if you say, I want to work with 10 clients a month, well, why? Like, is that just because you think you're supposed to, or is that because like you actually want to serve more people in uh, helping them lose weight or in helping them, uh, you know, lift more weight or get more jacked? Like, why is that? And, and even further to that, like, if you want to help serve people, like, why does that matter to you serving people? You know, again, this is going to get deep on like, what's your purpose? Like, why does any of this stuff matter? Because at the end of the day, if you wanted to have like a more comfortable, easy life, you just go get a nine to five and shut her down. Right. But we're, if we're trying to build a business, if we're trying to do things kind of quote unquote, the hard way, there's got to be deep reasoning behind it. There's got to be that why to inspire you and keep you moving forward. Right. Cause if, even if let's say you set the goal too low and you hit it two months into the quarter, well, what's going to keep you going? other than that intention of like, what is this going to do for me? Right. And then the last piece that I'll go through is what are some processes that I can specifically do, right. To focus on the process, not the outcome is what are some processes that I can focus on, uh, to get me moving, to get me moving in the direction of what I want to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. And like, there's a lot that I kind of, uh, thought about as you're sharing that and just some is just context that I have from from how we've gotten to know each other over the last few weeks is just that we've talked about our podcast production and how I do a mine all myself it's because I've leaned into that that's I've just defined that as being like one of my three special skills and yeah. that's just I went hard and it became something that started off taking up like way more of my time than I could afford. But because I like invested my time into it, um, then I was able to to narrow that down a bit. And then we flipped the table over to you where you've had the self-awareness to know that that was going to be something that you needed help with. And I think that's going to be an important crossroads for a lot of people. Um, and I can say that from experience because part of what I do is I'm the guy that people hire for, whether it be like online training or social media stuff. Like I, I'm the person that people hire in so that they can maintain that boundary between, um, like life and career. We kind of yep. brushed over that just as though most people know how to set those those parameters, but some people really struggle. Like some people are just, they think it's normal to just absolutely burn themselves out or they think it's normal that because Joe Blow on Instagram wanted 10 clients, they should have 10 clients kind of thing. Yep. Um, when's been the most heartbreaking instance that you've seen someone else in that situation where they were just comparing themselves to someone else so much that they just basically burnt themselves out. Yeah. I mean, I, I, like I see that every day with our potential clients and with a lot of our clients. I, I remember one client who, um, I, she wasn't a client at the time I connected with her and, and we got to chatting and it, it turned out that, you know, a lot of the people that I talked to want to make more money. But it turned out she was making good money. She was making like seven, eight K a month, but she literally didn't have time to see her husband and literally was like burning out like mentally, physically, just had, had nothing left in the tank and was like, I don't know how long I'm going to be able to do this. And it was a product of kind of being in scarcity mode with COVID hitting and then having a lot of people say they wanted to train with her and then just kind of bowing down to exactly what they needed, but having essentially having no systems in place. And um, it took a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of fear because some people ended up leaving uh, when she put boundaries in place and when she ended up charging more and those types of things. But um, at the end of the day, she got her life back. She got her marriage back. She was able to spend time with her husband. And, and I think to speak to your point, yeah, I would say to business owners and those people who feel like, like when you're a business owner, you wear 10 different hats. You're the head of marketing, you're the head of sales, uh, you're the head programmer, you're the, you know, you're the podcast producer. You, you have to do everything. You have to hire, uh, you have to fire, you have to, um, you know, 
Sometimes when you're a gym owner, clean the shitters. There's a lot of things that people have to do. And the so, something I learned very early on was as soon as you can afford it, take the things that you're not, not as good at or don't like doing and outsource them. G- delegate, get, get rid of them, right? So for me, the number one thing holding me back from having a podcast was the fact that I knew, I knew for a fact I had no idea how to, how to produce it, how to get it on the feed thing, all, those, all that shit. I had no idea how to do it. Right. But I really, I knew I was, I was great at having conversations and I wanted to talk to more people. So I solved that problem by hiring someone to produce my podcast for me. And all I do is I do the zoom thing and then I send it to them and they produce it. And then it's, it's on iTunes and shop or uh, Spotify. Um, and so, and I just want to make the point that sometimes that's not always possible. Right. So I say, Hey, delegate. And everyone's like, well, that costs money and I don't have that money. So there's two options. You can either delegate or you can reframe. And so one of the things that I've, I've helped a lot of people with is a lot of, a lot of coaches particularly don't like sales. They say, I'm not good at sales. I'm not a salesperson. I, people walk all over me. I just, you know, if they say they want a discount, I give it to them. We can reframe that too, right? While you probably don't have the money to outsource your sales to someone who's going to take a commission on every sale you can reframe sales to an opportunity to work with someone that, that needs your help. And you can reframe your price point from too expensive to people who pay more, pay more attention, right? So there's a couple of opportunities there when it comes to the way you think about things, right? And so for the client that I was talking about, uh, we delegated some things. Uh, we, we got her on a better path in terms of what she was charging, in terms of what the boundaries were that she was setting. And we created a ton of systems around things that she was like doing over and over and over again. She created systems around them to save herself some time. And she ended up getting hours and hours back and and really not losing much in income. Well, I mean, it's always cool to reflect on that stuff. Like even if a person goes and they takes their whole day, like, take your whole day and like write down exactly what you're doing on the hour every hour because I know for myself like a lot of my work is like legitimately in social media but if I like tracked the time I could cut it down substantially because like I mean social media is like a engine to drive you to go back to it like it is designed to retain your attention And so like if people, we talk about systems, if a person sets like a 10 minute microwave timer and you're not done the post in 10 minutes, then you know that there is something to be worked on and that doesn't cost any money. So it's just like opportunities everywhere. And then it's just like the value, like you and I being able to connect and just like talk about this stuff, that's an opportunity to develop yourself. And anybody that's feeling like just stagnant, I mean, it's something that I take pride in is... I'm not afraid to just talk to anybody on the internet kind of thing. Like as long as they're respectful, obviously, but it's just like, I I take it as an opportunity to grow. And if the other person agrees, then it's, it's a mutual thing. You, you get the opportunity to exchange ideas and maybe that's a business transaction. And maybe it's just like a, another connection, like something that turns you into someone who sees things differently or someone who, who has a new outlook for the next day kind of thing. And, and if they don't agree to chat with you, then you have your answer. They're not your people, right? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty clear and concise. Like if somebody just doesn't have the time, well, there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of, yeah. we, when we go to all these networking events, like not everybody's going to be for you. Not everybody's going to have the time, but some people, some people are, and that's like, that's the people to focus on kind of thing. Yeah. And, and I, I to to speak to the Instagram thing because I have fought this for a very long time. You know, first of all, you actually make money on social media. So, you know, that's a that's a that's an important distinction to make is like you're yes, you're spending a pretty good amount of time on it, but it actually there's a return on investment. So the first thing I would say to coaches and things like that around social media is if it's taking you a lot of time to make posts and things like that. And it's not making you a lot of money or any money, which is the case with a lot of coaches. That's something to look at 
you should probably either be making massive changes or hiring someone like a coach or like someone who can give you some advice on that. Because you, if you're spending time on it, time is your number one asset and time you cannot get back. So it'd be worthwhile to spend the money to learn how to do that thing better, right? So that's something that I would say. And so first of all, if you're not making money off Instagram, you're spending a bunch of time on it, trying to make money, change that, please, please change that. I don't care if you hire me or Chris or anybody else, just please hire somebody to help you. Um, the other piece though, is I fought it a lot with, I would, I would talk myself into the fact that I could just scroll because I was like, well, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I've got to get content ideas or I've got to see what other people are doing, or I've got to look at what our clients are doing so I can scroll. And I realized like, this is taking up way more of my time than it should be. I'm running a business with employees and I have like clients to work with and I'm scrolling Instagram and it's not productive. You know, when I'm making a post or when I'm talking to people in conversations, things like that, responding to comments, that's productive because we're moving people towards getting to know me better and those types of things. But when I'm just scrolling mindlessly, it's not productive. So one quick hack for people doesn't really change anything. Actually, there's two options, two things you can do. Number one, I just did this last week. It's been super helpful. Click and hold the Instagram icon and click remove from home screen. So now it's no longer on your home screen. Anytime you want to go to Instagram, there's an extra step. You have to swipe and search it to find it. So there's an extra step that you have to be mindful of before you get to Instagram. So that's one thing. And it's helped me so much. The other thing uh, that a friend of mine did is she created, uh, and I tried this and it didn't work. I'm hoping to try it again, but she created an Instagram account for her pet, or you can just create it like with a, with like a different name. And that's where she keeps the people that she wants to follow. And, you know, um, she wants to scroll through her friends from high school, whatever. And her business one, she doesn't follow anybody. Um, and her business one is just for posting and work and conversations. And that's the one that she leaves signed in. So if she wants to scroll, she has to sign out of that one, which anybody who knows this knows that Instagram is a pain in the ass to do that and sign into the other one before she can just start mindlessly scrolling. So just a couple hacks there for people around social media. I love that. That's, that's cool. And I like that, like sleek way of just utilizing the pet account. Cause like I follow a lot of people's dogs. Like I probably follow like 40 people's dogs. I can't help it. They're just awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So create one for your own dog and that's where you can have fun with your content and piss around and whatever, do what you want. And that's where you can follow people's stuff like friends and family. Um, it's again, it's something I'm still working on. I will make that caveat, but um, yeah, there's a few options there to, to make life a little easier with intention, of course, right around, around social media. For sure. And to keep us on track with time, I have one final thing to ask of you before we, uh, finish off the episode. And I've been getting my guests to give a challenge for the day. So it's basically you say what their challenge is, and it could be anything that you kind of think would enrich their day that we haven't already discussed. Um, and just whenever you're ready, just be like your challenge for the day is, and just let them have it. All right. This is a little long winded if that's okay. We're, we're doing a challenge for our VIP groups right now. So this is the perfect opportunity and I'm doing it as well. Your challenge for the day today is to take one fear or belief that has been rattling around in your head and to bust it. And I'm going to tell you how. So you're going to take this belief, whatever it is, I'm, I'm not good enough. I can never make enough money, whatever. You're going to write that belief down. And then you're going to ask yourself four questions. The first question is, is this true? And it might be true. It may be partially true. There's maybe an opportunity that it's true. The second question is, do I know this to be true without a shadow of a doubt? That's what's always going to squash the belief because you can't know that it's true without a shadow of a doubt. The third question is what happens when I believe this thought or when I buy into this fear? And the fourth is who would I be if I didn't believe this thought or if I chose not to buy into this fear? And then you can write the truth is this and you can bust beliefs in that way. We're doing uh, busting one belief per day for a month. That's the goal. Uh, so anything, whether it's around money, around your business, around your fitness, around your relationships, 
around anything, bust those beliefs. And do you have people write that stuff out and just write it on paper kind of thing? Yeah. So we have our clients, um, they can write it out on paper. We also gave them a little sheet with those four questions just to remind them like a, a Google doc. And then we just have them, uh, in our Slack group, uh, say completed day, whatever. And then they can fill it in. Uh, we have a little tracking form for them. It's like, you know, August 4th, I busted this belief. I love that. I think it's important to have that kind of structure to keep kind of keep people on track, not just to say it, but to like put it into writing, to have it on something that they can look at throughout the day kind of thing. And again, I said this earlier, but I kind of said it in passing when you are having fears and beliefs and, and, and limiting beliefs and thoughts that aren't serving you, they have a lot of power over you when they're in your head. But as soon as you write them down, as soon as you get them out of your head and on paper, you realize you, you can take their power away. You realize they're not as powerful as you think they are, especially when you go through this bus, this belief busting exercise. And that's directly from Byron Katie. If you guys want any more information on that, I'd be happy to provide that. But um, you can take their power away and realize that the thing that you're scared of, right? The opposite is just as likely as that, as that thing right? It's, it's the, the thing that you're most scared of is, is there's maybe a possibility it could happen, but the opposite of it, like making a hundred thousand dollars a month is just as likely to happen. So you can really get into a much better, more self-serving headspace that, that will allow you to move forward. I love that. And with all that being said, I'd like to thank you so much for being on the show today. It's been a slice. My man, thanks for doing this.